Good morning. It is Senate Health and Welfare Committee, and it is April 9th. Today, we're going to look at two bills relating to health care um, affordability and accessibility, uh, working to, to determine how best to move forward with what some are calling health care reform. And uh, so we'll, we'll look at S-132 and S-120. And before we begin, I think, um, uh, just to digress for a second, I've asked, um, I've been working with, with Nellie and asked Ruth uh, to put together a spreadsheet uh, along with Nolan on some of the budget requests that we're seeing. And so, and so, uh, and so thank you very much, Ruth. <laughs> I think Nellie is getting you some information and information keeps coming in from people requesting either ARPA funds or um, rec some base budget uh, improvements. So we'll, we're will we gonna put all of those together and on, on Tuesday, um, we'll be able to look at that spreadsheet and the requests that have come in from various uh, parties. Not all of them have been in committee, I wanna make that clear, but they are written fairly clearly and hopefully with our background and the work that we've done in the past on these organizations, both with CRF and uh, more recently, we'll be able to make some, uh, establish some priorities. So um, I'm looking to Ruth and working with Nolan. <laughs> and so, uh, so we'll try to get that out to everyone before the end of the weekend. Does that make sense, Ruth, or Monday? What, what's yeah, I'll try to get it to you Monday morning. Um, okay. Nolan has sent me a first um, list, which Nolan, I haven't looked at yet, but um, I will work on it this weekend. If if any of you have things that be, that you want to send me also, we'll put it on the list. I'm going to try to color code it or organize it in some way we can go through it easily. Perfect. Sounds terrific. So then uh, we'll look at, um, you can bring in what you have on Tuesday and we'll go through it. That'd be great. And Nolan, thank you. That is, this won't be easy. I know that we've got things in the budget and then we also have requests for um, one-time money. So it, it, sorting it out, sorting out our priorities, our policy priorities is number one and then where the money comes from will be up to appropriations. Um, so, but we'll have to see how the, all that fits together. Uh huh. Okay. So, um, Jen Carby is here with us to go through uh, two bills. Uh, the first bill, S one thirty two. Let me just explain a little bit about what's in that bill. And I would, I would like to say right from the outset, there's a lot in that bill that, that is going to be, as we go through the bill, um, I or you uh, on the committee can make some decisions about the difficulty of uh, evaluating those and including those in, in any legislation at, at this time of the session. So I'm happy to discard. Um, there are a number of things that I've already decided we might want to consider discarding. On the other hand, um, there's a the goal for us in making healthcare more accessible and more affordable as much as possible to align the payer system that we have. So, and when we think about aligning a payer system, then that leads to um, more uniform access for folks and also then allows for us to consider how to reduce uh, co-pays and other um, uh, premiums that patients uh, right now are experiencing some really, uh, a lot of hardship and healthcare has reached a very high cost. It continues to go up. And then also knowing that some of the reform efforts that we have have uh, held back and held down uh, the increase at least um, the 3.5% cap, I will call it a cap, but 3.5 cent budget restraint uh, for hospitals has been uh, so effective. And so we wanna 
keep looking at some of those things that are helping keep the reins on costs without um, harming the system itself. So that's one. Another goal that I, uh, I see and I'm very committed to, which has been a part of the ACO discussion, is the relationship between provider community, medical provider community, and our social service community, and ensuring that we have some continuity of care and that there is some case management going forward that allows for people not to get lost in this system. And again, that comes back to how we align our um, social services and our uh, health care, what you know, make the medical services uh, together. So um, there's a lot of thinking that we will want to do. And I know that you all have been consider thinking about this. And uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Jen uh, to go through S132 and then to go through 120. And our goal today is simply to, to look at the bills. So, and then we're going to hear from DFR who's doing some work on um, the um, uh, basic benefits is what I always call it, but that's not what it is. Jen, benchmark, pl you can Thank benchmark you. plan is Thank what they're going to talk about. I think. Know. Our benchmark plan uh, with respect, uh, with respect to um, hearing aid assistance. So I want to hear from them because that's something we might be able to uh, continue to work on along with DFR and others. So then after we've gone through those two bills, we're going to come back to some primary care issues with the Green Mountain Care Board. And we'll try to take a break in between. So there we are. So Jen, thank you for being here. And um, we'll look forward to going through those two bills. I know that one is a little more uh, a bumpier road than the other, but let's, let's see where it takes us. Great, thank you. Good morning, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. I will put the bill up on the screen. Okay, hopefully you can see that. This is S-132, um, an act relating to healthcare reform implementation. It has a number of different topics in it, so I tried to use these reader assistance headings just to kind of ground you in what the topic is as we go through. So the first couple of sections are on responsibility for healthcare reform efforts. Section one would amend the existing section that creates the position of the director of healthcare reform in the agency of administration, um, which is currently responsible for coordination of healthcare reform system, healthcare system reform efforts um, across the executive branch. Uh, this would add then a specific requirement that the director of healthcare reform be the one to coordinate and lead all state initiatives relating to healthcare reform, including innovations in healthcare system payment and delivery. Section two deals with the all payer model, the full name of which is the all payer accountable care organization model. And this says that upon renewal of the terms of that model agreement, the all-payer model agreement with CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Agency of Human Services would re assume responsibility for oversight of state efforts to achieve the agreement targets in the model as set forth in an existing statute and any similar or successor model and Agency of Human Services would lead the state's efforts to achieve the agreement targets the state's renegotiation efforts and the stakeholder involvement processes. So this is um, expanding on, on the role of the director of healthcare reform in the agency of human services and the role of the agency itself in the state's healthcare reform initiatives. Jen, who, who or, or wait, do you want us to wait till you're all done or interrupt you as you go, which is easier? What, whatever, you, it's probably easier if you just ask your questions as we go along, because we'll be looking at the language. Okay. So go for it. Who has these responsibilities now? Uh, right now, the a, a lot of the efforts or uh, uh, responsibilities are split between the director of healthcare reform, um, the Green Mountain Care Board, 
um, those are sort of the, the main ones. And I think the idea here would be is to move all of that kind of reform minded effort under the director of healthcare reform and leave the regulatory duties with the Green Mountain Care Board. Okay, thanks. Senator Lyons, is that, I mean, you're, you're the sponsor, so I can uh, that, that's let accurate. you speak for yourself as well. Yeah, no, that's accurate. So that was the first two sections, and then we move more directly into ACOs um, oh, section. Sorry. Jen, before before we yes. go on, if I can, Senator Lyons. So, can you just clarify the ACOs role here? I mean, if we have the the director um, having authority and the board having authority, then what what's the role of the ACO? The ACO's involvement is really in carrying out the healthcare reform efforts. So the state has designed them. The ACO is playing a role in achieving them, um, but isn't the one overseeing or um, it, it's the one being overseen. It's the one being regulated and um, and participating in the healthcare reform initiatives. Okay. All right. Thanks. And then we go on. I mean, we we the state also regulates ACOs, and we're going to look at some potential changes to uh, those requirements in these next sections. Section three amends the existing law where the Green Mountain Care Board is required to certify accountable care organizations and do annual budget review for accountable care organizations. And so the first part of that existing statute is the certification piece. Um, and it requires uh, under existing law that uh, in order to, uh, to certify an ACO to operate in the state, the board must ensure that certain criteria are met. So this is adding to those. There's an existing uh, criteria about the ACO's governance, leadership and management structure. This would include language that says the salaries for the ACO's executive officers do not exceed an amount equal to the median salary for a primary care physician participating in the ACO. So looking to put some, some guardrails some boundaries on the salaries for the executive officers. The next piece adds on to some existing language around coordination with the Blueprint for Health. And this would specify that the ACO coordinates with the Blueprint's patient-centered medical homes and community health teams and acts as the link connecting patients with appropriate health care and social services, including those offered by designated agencies, specialized service agencies, parent-child centers, and schools. Um, then in another existing provision around the ACO's um, acceptance and contracting with uh, providers to participate in the ACO, this allows, specifically allows the ACO to contract with a participating provider for a multi-year term. So it doesn't just have to be a one-year contract, it can be a multi-year contract. So those are all in the certification piece. And then in the budget review piece, where existing law directs the board to review and consider certain items, this would add on to the existing provision around information on the ACO's administrative costs and it would say, including either the annual salaries and benefits for all of the ACO's employees or the same salary and other compensation information for the ACO's officers, directors, key employees, and other highly compensated employees for the previous calendar year that the ACO provided to the IRS on its Form 990 for the most recent tax year or that the ACO would have been required to perform to provide on Form 990 if it was exempt from federal income tax. So this is really um, piggybacking on the existing IRS criteria around what kind of salary and compensation information has to be reported for nonprofit organizations exempt from federal income tax under 26 USC Section 501. Um, but I think at, the, at least currently, the, the, the one ACO that is certified in the state is not a uh, nonprofit under uh, federal income tax laws. So it says report the information like you would if you were tax exempt. Um, and if they are tax exempt, then just provide that same form 990 information. And then it finally, it adds a new 
budget review piece for the board to review and consider. And that is the extent to which the ACO has met the quality measures specified in its payer contracts. And if one or more of the quality measures has not been met, the ACOs and payers plan to remedy the deficiencies. So that's all in the context of the Green Mountain Care Board's certification and review of ACO budgets. Then this would add a new section uh, in section four, we're going to add a new statutory so section. I want to just stop sure. there for a sec, Jen. Uh, there, is there anything currently that asks the Green Mountain Care Board to evaluate the quality metric analysis that's going on with the ACO? Uh, I'd have to. I'd have to look. Yeah. I'm not, I have to say okay. I'm not fluent we'll enough. We'll hear from in, the Green Mountain Care Board right. how they incorporate that, but certainly it's an I, important aspect. I do think there are some uh, there. I do think there are some provisions in the existing law that require the ACO to have um, quality measures and to be evaluating them. This is looking more at the this outcomes of that, at the results of that. So then we have a new section uh, around the ACO, the value-based payments and distribution of shared savings. And this creates a role for the Green Mountain Care Board in that. So it says that the Green Mountain Care Board, using the results of an ACO's quality analyses pursuant to a section we're gonna see coming up, so a new section. So the Green Mountain Care Board, using the results of the ACO's quality analyses, must establish a methodology for determining the amounts of the value-based payments that the ACO must make to its participating providers for delivering services to its attributed patients. So the board would create a methodology for determining the amounts of the value-based payments. And then the board shall apply its methodology and shall notify health insurers and Vermont Medicaid of the value-based payment amounts based on its determinations in order to inform the insurer's developments of their rates for health insurance rate review, the board does, and to inform Medicaid's development of its all-inclusive population-based payment arrangements that the board reviews in accordance with existing law as well. So this is, just to, to summarize this, is directing the board to come up with a way to a methodology for determining the amounts of the value-based payments and then calculating them and telling them telling the insurers and Medicaid what they are so they can be built into um, their financial models, their rate reviews, and their all-inclusive population-based payment arrangement. And currently, that value-based payment uh, is determined by the ACO. I think it's the between the ACO and the payers. And the payers, right. So this would put the board in that role instead. And then it also would have the board, and it's a few words, but it's a big impact, would have the board using, again, the results of the ACO's quality analyses that we'll see in the next section to determine appropriate allocations of shared savings, if any, for distribution among the ACO's participating providers. So this piece is having the board figure out how much, if they're shared savings, how those should be distributed among the ACO's participating providers. And this is something that currently, I believe, is just the ACO that's in this role. Section five is a new section that would go in with the ACO, some statutes around the ACO itself. Um, so in a different chapter from the board, um, because it's really about the ACO, this directs an ACO to collect and analyze clinical data regarding patients' age, health condition or conditions, healthcare services received, and clinical outcomes in order to determine the quality of the care provided to its attributed patients, implement targeted quality improvement measures, and ensure proper care coordination and delivery across the continuum of care. So having the ACO collect and analyze data about, about what's going on with its attributed lives um, to, to determine quality and figure out how to improve things and um, ensure proper care coordination. And it requires the ACO to provide the results of its quality analyses to the Green Mountain Care Board so uh, to inform the board's determinations of the amounts of the ACO's value-based payments to participating providers and to calculate appropriate allocations of shared savings for distribution to the participating providers. So in the previous section of the statute of the, of the bill that we'd looked at, it would create, it would create a new um, some new roles for the Green Mountain Care Board informed by this 
ACO data collection and analysis. And then here's the flip side of that, directing the ACO to do that collection, data collection and analysis and provide it to the Green Mountain Care Board. Jen? Yes. In, isn't paragraph A, aren't they already supposed to be doing something like that? I mean, that seems to be what they say they're doing. Right. I, I don't, I'm not sure that this is a new role for them, but it's not a statutory requirement. So okay. this is this is kind of putting it in the statute in part so that that information can be uh, can be provided to the board, directed to be provided to the board to inform the board's work around the value based payments and shared savings. OK, thanks. So sure. And I'm sure the ACO could tell you what they're doing in this area currently, but I, I don't know that it was necessarily intended as a completely new role. All right. And then section six. Um, is some language that has also appeared in, uh, I think there's a, a standalone bill that may be either out in the wall in this committee or in another committee that would require a certified ACO to make available to the office of the auditor of accounts, so the state auditor, all records of the ACO and any affiliated entity that the auditor and the auditor's discretion and upon request determines are needed to enable the auditor's office to audit the ACO's financial statements, receipt and use of federal and state funds and performance as set forth in the, the statute creating and setting forth the duties of the state auditor. So this again is requiring the ACO to provide all the information to the auditor that the auditor thinks his office needs to audit the ACO um, and ensure appropriate use of federal and state monies. All right, so then we get into a section on the Green Mountain Care Board's duties. And this is really kind of, I put it here as kind of a bridge section um, because it, it incorporates what we just looked at and then what comes next. This adds two new duties to the Green Mountain Care Board. The first being to establish the methodology for determining the amounts of an ACO's value-based payments and appropriate, alloca appropriate allocation of shared savings among the ACO's participating providers. So that was the piece that we looked at. And then in the next section, we'll see this new duty to review and approve proposed fee schedules and healthcare contracts between health plans and healthcare providers. And so here is a new section, which did you want to just, just uh, on a sure. comment on the number of contracts that are there is probably what what we understand is that they are significant. So I guess the discussion around contracts really goes to uh, maybe goes to um, model contracts or some kind of uh, evaluation of fewer contracts than all of them so it sound, would be probably unbelievably difficult to do all of them. That yeah, and I think we'll see as we go through and, and you know, you've set up a process for kind of uh, for the board to, to collect a representative sample and get a sense for what they would be reviewing for. Um, so there may be modifications needed at that point. Um, I will note as I was sort of looking through the bill preparing to do the walkthrough this morning that I uh, appear to have used 9384, section 9384 as a new section twice. It's because we currently, the statutes currently go through 9383 here. So this would be something to change going forward and it does get referred to and cross references a few times. So apologies for the error and any confusion. But this would add a new section uh, in the Green Mountain Care Board statutes around review of healthcare contracts and fee schedules. It, uh, uses some existing definitions in chapter 221, subchapter 2, which is on claims processing and contract standards for health insurance plans. And then it says that a healthcare contract between a health plan or other contracting entity and a healthcare provider shall not be effective until it has been reviewed and approved by the Green Mountain Care Board for fairness and consistency with the provisions of that subchapter on uh, claims processing contract standards, the board's rules and other applicable laws. So healthcare contract would not be effective until the board has reviewed and approved it. And similarly, a fee schedule setting forth the amounts that a health plan or other contracting entity shall reimburse a healthcare provider for delivering healthcare services shall not be effective until it has been reviewed and approved by the Green Mountain Care Board for fairness and compliance with the board's rules and other applicable laws. 
and it directs the board to adopt rules establishing the fee schedule and healthcare contract review processes, including the standards under which the board will review proposed fee schedules and healthcare contracts. So there, that might be an opportunity to, to lay out some things that would, uh, that would be appropriate once they determine what they should be reviewing for. Then there's some changes, section nine makes some changes to an existing statute on fair contract standards. And this is about contracts between payers and providers. So the changes in here, other than a, just a grammatical correction, um, are first to eliminate language, allowing contracting entities to require healthcare providers to execute written confidentiality agreements with respect to fee schedule and claim edit information received from contracting entities. Um, and then putting in language requiring contracting entities to provide at least 120 days for a provider to consider a proposed contract and for negotiation of contract terms, including reimbursement amounts. Adding language requiring that healthcare contracts must be for a minimum of two years and that prior to healthcare contract taking effect, it must be reviewed and approved by the Greenmount Care Board for fairness and consistency with the provisions of the subchapter, the board's rules, and other applicable laws. And then it takes out this uh, language that says that requirements of subdivision B5 of the section do not prohibit a contracting entity from requiring a reasonable confidentiality agreement between the provider and the contracting entity about the terms of the proposed contract. So taking on a couple of provisions around confidentiality. Section 10 requires the Green Mountain Care Board to collect and review a representative sample of healthcare contracts and fee schedules from health insurers, including contracts and fee schedules with hospital affiliated and non-hospital affiliated healthcare providers in order to inform the board's development of its methodology for reviewing healthcare contracts and fee schedules in accordance with that new section. And on or before January 15th of 2022, the board would provide information to the House Healthcare Committee, this committee, and the Finance Committee regarding the board's proposed methodology for reviewing healthcare contracts and fee schedules, including the standards and criteria that the board intends to use for its reviews. And then it, um, says that confidential business information and trade secrets received from an insurer um, through those sample representative sample of contracts would be exempt from public inspection and copying under the Public Records Act and kept confidential, except the board can disclose or release information publicly in summary or aggregate form if doing so would not disclose confidential business information or trade secrets. So they can kind of tell you what seems to be, you know, themes um, or particular types of um, sections that are or provisions that are in the contracts, um, but without disclosing business secrets. All right, then we're going to turn to a different topic. This is on durable medical equipment. Uh, let me just say, this is a bill that we've had in committee. Um, I don't even know. I don't know whether we introduced it this year or not. Um, possibly not. I don't not. think so. But it is a concern. Uh, the cost of durable medical equipment continues to be a concern across the board. So uh, unless you're selling it yourself, uh, the, the providers, the payers, everyone is concerned about these costs. So uh, I've included it here. This would add a new subchapter in uh, 18 VSA chapter 221, which is on healthcare administration sort of broadly on durable medical equipment and cost transparency. So it starts out with a definition of durable medical equipment, which means equipment such as a walker, wheelchair, or home oxygen equipment that meets these criteria can withstand repeated use. It primarily and customarily serves a medical purpose. It generally is not useful to an individual without an illness or injury and is appropriate for use in the home. It requires health insurers to provide clear information to patients regarding their out-of-pocket exposure for the purchase of items of durable medical equipment. It would direct a provider of durable medical equipment to inform a patient whether it would be more cost-effective for that patient to purchase a specific item of durable medical, and I found another typo this morning, equipment, not insurance, whether it'd be more cost-effective for the patient to 
to purchase the specific item for cash rather than using insurance. And it prohibits a health insurer from, or it says a health insurer cannot prohibit or penalize a provider of durable medical equipment for disclosing to an insured the cash price for an item or for providing information to an insured about the insured's cost sharing amount for the item of durable medical equipment. So for some of you, this may sound somewhat familiar. Um, it's similar to the prohibitions on gag clauses as they've been called for uh, in pharmacies for prescription drug prices that you passed a few years ago. So it's, it's sort of a similar, similar type of um, information to the consumer and prohibition on um, limiting what the, the seller can or the provider can inform the patient about. Then we get into, as Senator Lyons mentioned before we started, the health insurance coverage for hearing aids. This is a bill that is either on your wall or in the finance committee. Um, I th or no, I guess it's in the House. This, but this time it's in the House. It was in finance yeah, last I don't, year. We, I don't think, Senator Cummings, you're muted. I don't think you have it this year. Yeah, no, I don't think yeah. we have it this year. No. It I'm, didn't make it out last year. Right. right. And, exactly we, right. and we had a similar bill in health and welfare at one point, and then it got um, moved over to you and finance. But uh, again, and this, this is the- It was cost. What, the, yeah, so DFR is working with other interested parties on this issue, so we'll hear from them. Right, and they're it. not necessarily working specifically no, for on, the the on the hearing aid part yeah. piece, but yes, yeah, so, so I think some of it will make more sense as we go through. Okay. This would add a new section to the statutes on hearing aids. Um, and what's important for this is the definition of health insurance plan because it's really defined in a way that um, does not include the individual and small group plans sold both in and outside the exchange or the reflective plans. Um, so this means uh, it defines it as a group health insurance policy or health benefit plan uh, offered by a health insurer and includes Medicaid. So it does include Medicaid and any other plan offered or administered by the state or a subdivision or instrumentality of the state. So that pulls in the state employees plan and the plans offered to teachers but it does not include a qualified health benefit plan or reflective health benefit plan offered in accordance with those statutes or a policy or plan providing coverage for a specified disease or other limited benefit coverage. So I'll take a pause here to explain why it's written this way. Um, and this is some of what you'll start to get into with DFR as well. There is a requirement under the Affordable Care Act, and we may have talked about this before, um, that the state defray the state pay the cost of any new health insurance mandate enacted after 2011. Um, so for the qualified health plans for the individual for Vermont individual and small group market plans, if you were to enact a requirement that health those plans cover hearing aids, the state would have to pay all of the additional premium attributable to that new mandate. That's what's called state defrayal. So this is written to take kind of an incremental approach so that the mandate would apply to the large group and to the governmental self-funded plans, which we can regulate. It would apply to them now or starting in 2022 and then set up a process for trying to, uh, to for looking at changing the state's benchmark plan um, to include hearing aid coverage. But you'll hear from DFR more about um, the benchmark plan and, and what's involved in that. It's not as simple as um, just adding a benefit. Um, you have to make other changes as well. So that's why health insurance plan is defined to really be large group, including state employees and teachers and also Medicaid for this purpose. So then it defines hearing aid as any small, wearable electronic instrument or device designed and intended for the ear for the purpose of aiding or compensating for impaired human hearing and any parts, attachments, or accessories, including ear molds and associated remote microphones that pair with hearing aids to improve, improve word comprehension in difficult listening situations in live or telecommunication settings. The term does not include batteries, cords, large audience assisted listening devices, such as those designed for auditoriums or standalone assisted listening devices that can function without a hearing aid. 
Hearing aid professional services is the practice of fitting, selecting, dispensing, selling, or servicing hearing aids or a combination, including evaluation for hearing aid, fitting, programming, hearing aid repairs, follow-up adjustments, servicing, and maintenance of a hearing aid, ear mold impressions, and auditory rehabilitation and training. Hearing aid professional is an audiologist or hearing aid dispenser licensed under uh, the professional licensing statutes. A physician, so an osteopathic physician or a medical doctor, a physician assistant or an advanced practice registered nurse. So then it requires a health insurance plan to cover the cost of a hearing aid for each year and the associated hearing aid professional services when the hearing aid or aids are prescribed, fitted, and dispensed by a hearing care professional. The coverage provided by a health plan for hearing aids and associated services shall be limited only by medical necessity, but a covered individual can select a hearing aid that's in excess of what's medically necessary um, and pay the additional cost. The coverage required by the section shall not be subject to a deductible co-payment or co-insurance requirement that is less favorable to the covered individual than those that would apply generally to other non-primary care items and services under the plan. And then it specifies that a covered individual who has exhausted all applicable internal review procedures provided by the health insurance plan shall have the right to an independent external review as set forth in statute, except for Medicaid. Um, a Medicaid beneficiary's grievance would be redressed by the, um, the Human Services Board as set forth in 3 VSA Section 3091. So that's health insurance coverage in that large, large group and Medicaid. And then Section 13 would direct in the timeline, looked a lot more manageable in January, um, but on or before May 7th, 2021, the Agency of Human Services in consultation with DFR, who you're going to hear from, and the Green Mountain Care Board, must apply to CMS to modify the essential health benefits in Vermont's benchmark plan to include coverage of hearing aids and related services at a minimum standard of medical necessity beginning in plan year 2023. And so that the reason for this date is that that is the deadline um, under the federal requirements to apply to change your benchmark plan for plan year 2023. So if you did something after that, it would be for a later plan year. It directs the agency to contract for actuarial services to the extent necessary to prepare the actual actuarial certification and report required as part of the application process. It would have had the agency provide a draft by April 1st of 2021. So obviously we'd have to relook at the dates. The agency provide a draft of its completed application materials, including the actuarial certification and report to the Medicaid and Exchange Advisory Committee and the Office of the Healthcare Advocate and make them available on its website. It would require the agency to accept public comment on the application materials, to respond to all public comments, and to incorporate the public comments into the final application materials when practicable. And it would require the agency to provide periodic updates on the disposition of its application to the House Healthcare Committee, this committee, the Finance Committee, the Medicaid and Exchange Advisory Committee, and the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Section 14 would direct the Agency of Human Services to seek approval from CMS to provide coverage of hearing aids for individuals enrolled in Medicaid as set forth in that earlier section that actually spelled out the coverage. Uh, because that is in excess of the existing covered requirements in Medicaid. So, so we're getting close to the end. Section 15 is a change to the state health improvement plan, which is an existing requirement um, for the Secretary of Human Services or designee. This would specify that it would be, in fact, the Commissioner of Health, not the Secretary or designee, um, in consultation with others who would adopt the state health improvement plan and amend it as appropriate. Then we get into some reports. Section 16 would have the Green Mountain Care Board by January 15th, 2022, provide to the House Health Care, this committee, and finance 
an analysis of the increases in health insurers' administrative expenses over the most recent five-year period for which information is available, and a comparison of those increases with increases in the consumer price index. So look at increases in health insurers' administrative expenses with increases in the consumer price index. Section 17 directs the Director of Healthcare Reform and the Agency of Human Services to provide information by January 15th of 2022 to this committee and the House Healthcare Committee regarding the manner in which specialty care will be incorporated appropriately into the all-payer model and when that incorporation would occur. Section 18 directs each accountable care organization certified by our existing processes um, to, re to provide information by January 15, 2022 to this committee and House Health Care, uh, provide a description of the ACO's initiatives to connect primary care practices with social service providers, including the specific individuals or position titles responsible for carrying out these care coordination efforts. So we'll report on exactly what it is that they're doing to connect primary care practices with social service providers, including whose job it is to do that. Section 19 has some um, reports on uh, on what it would look like to have two, at least two primary care visits per year without cost sharing. So the first part requires DIVA in consultation with DFR, health insurers, and other interested stakeholders to provide an analysis by January 15, 2022 to House Health Care, this committee, and finance. This analysis would be of the likely impacts on qualified health plans, patients, providers, health insurance premiums and population health of requiring individual and small group health insurance plans to provide each insured with at least two primary care visits per year with no cost sharing requirements. And then a separate report from the Green Mountain Care Board in consultation with DFR and the Department of, uh, and DHR of Human Resources uh, to report Oh, and I'm sorry, health insurers and other interested stakeholders to report by January 15th, 2022, with analysis of the likely impacts on patients, providers, health insurance premiums and population health. So the same criteria of requiring large group health insurance plans, including plans offered to state employees and to school employees to provide each insured with at least two primary care visits per year with no cost sharing requirements. And then finally, we get into the effective dates, which I can we can go through, or we can hold those for another time, whatever you prefer. We can hold those unless someone okay. read them. We're good. Okay. Right. Just know they're there. Uh, questions for Jen. Okay, so there are a number of things I think in the bill that uh, require a, a analysis. Uh, and study so uh, and some of those including the last sections on primary care uh, are things that we might want to fold into um, into a single there are a number of things in the bill including the primary care that we may want to fold into a single uh, analysis or set of analyses so and then one comment on the health improvement plan that is was traditionally done in the um, in the Department of Health. That plan, I think, we should ask to have updated by a date certain, if if we can do that. Uh, and I don't know what the requirements are in statute in terms of an annual update. Or uh, do you remember? Jen? I think the language was uh, to update as the commissioner or as the secretary or designee deems appropriate. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me just pull up the. Some of that uh, is in the bill. Yeah, I know. I get. I just think it might be helpful to have it updated, because it it, it can be the data that's collected by the health department is uh, important in informing the Green Mountain Care Board around the health resource allocation plan, which is then used for CON and other distribution of services. So. That's the reason that that's in there, and we haven't talked about it in a long time. We can get 
someone in to talk about that if people are interested. I'm interested, but okay. All right. So you're all set to vote it out, it sounds like. <laughs> uh, sorry. Go ahead, Ruth. There's just a lot in there and it's, um, and a lot of it's sort of, I mean, it's obviously all related, but it's, it's, there's it's a lot, lot that's not directly related. And the, the sort of regulatory changes, it's hard for me to sort of figure out what impact they would have. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I, you know, and I, I completely agree with you. I think that this it was meant to uh, stimulate some conversation. And I think as we hear testimony, and as you heard yesterday from Ina Bacchus, some of the um, recommendations that they're going to be making about the all payer model next gen to, to ask for some changes. Some of what's in this bill, A, may not need to be done, but B, also might, uh, as I said before, fit into some kind of analysis, either uh, with an independent consultant or within the Green Mountain Care Board or AHS. So we, we, there are some choices there or you know whether we even want to pursue some of those at this time based on what we're hearing from folks. So not... There's, there's no, uh, I'm not committed to moving this. Okay. Senator Cummings. No, I'm just struggling with timing. We worked on hearing aids. <laughs> and again, you know, I, I see that you're pretty much limiting it to state employees. But at the present time, we're struggling over whether or not we can afford state employee pensions and to be increasing health care coverage at the same time is a lot. Um, so I just, think you're right. There's a lot here, but uh, the goal is actually to uh, improve access also affordability. So, in, and we know how critical hearing aids are to sort of um, mitigating the effects of uh, aging, uh, Alzheimer's or and but So are dentures. So just assume yeah. that dentures are Put coming those, next. Uh, yeah, um, they may as well. Uh, yeah, but who pays for retired employees' health care? I know we pay for teachers. Who pays, if you're retiring at 60, who pays your health insurance? Well, uh, you, you go to Medicare, remember that. Not until 65. Yes. I, I do think that there is, so I think that some of the other post-employment benefits is not my area, but, um, but I think I mean, are we adding my question is, are we adding to the pension cost? We definitely would be adding to the cost of teachers retirement. I don't. So uh, I, don't, I don't know that the language as written applies to retired employees. But um, we but provide health care for retired teachers. Yes, but that's not the language that's it talks about school employees, not retirees. Um, but okay. you need to. You, I think, would need yeah, to hear because from. The bulk of people I hear from, from hearing aids, are retired. Um, and that's so, but that, that's but, where the but need. also, then, if it's an early onset hearing loss, that could be that's one thing significantly more important in terms of living one's life with a quality, with quality outcomes. Does Medicare cover hearing aids, Jen? No. No, no, not at all. Senator Hooker. Uh, I, 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 you know, like everyone else has said, there's a lot here. And I was just um, wondering about Medicare and how that fits in, because I know it doesn't cover hearing aids. Uh, you know, what, 
what other implications does this have for Medicare? Nothing. You can't Nothing. affect Medicare. I mean, you right. could create a state only benefit that you provide to people who are on Medicare, on Medicare. Yeah. Um, you know, we, you've done like that the, with in prescription drugs with VFARM. Yeah. You've done a wrap, yeah. um, but that okay. would be all state dollars. Yeah. And that is a significant portion of the population. I would and it's growing every day. Uh, you know what I'm going to suggest because we're in this conversation uh, and it's moved uh, to hearing aids. I suggest that we hear from Jill Rickard and Emily Brown, who are here um, from DFR. And Jill, thank you for being here. Why don't we Why don't we hear hear what you have to say about what you're doing at this point? And that would be very helpful, May, maybe inform us about what we can do uh, within the legislative process to facilitate some outcomes. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jill Rickard. I'm the Director of Policy for DFR. <clears throat> we, um, we are current, we have applied for a two-year grant from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services to perform analysis related to our market. Um, and part of that analysis is actually the largest part of the grant is, is gonna be focused on reviewing and analyzing our benchmark plan and whether to change the benefits around um, or to add new benefits such as hearing aid coverage. Um, that is something we're interested in looking at. Of course, it takes um, actuarial analysis because when you increase the benefits in one place, you have to decrease the benefits in another place. And so we're engaging an actuary, which is a pretty expensive process to do that, um, which is why the timing in this bill is un not workable <laughs> if we wanted to right. us to look at that in, during that process, because there are state defrayal costs if you increase new, if you add new benefit mandates. So what we would propose is to give us time to take advantage of this really generous grant that we're expecting to receive any day now from CMS um, to explore the benchmark plan is if you would push out the dates all by one year such that we have, because it is a long process, A, to do the actuarial analysis, then we'll have to propose the new benefit mandates. Those have to be approved by the Green Mountain Care Board and then AHS would need to um, propose those to CMS that then would have to approve them. So that would take a year or more. Um, we could get it done in a year and if you moved those dates out all by one year, um, but then once they're approved by CMS, they would need to be effective for the 2024 plan year. Well, I, whatever dates to work for you, I think, uh, thank you. I'm sorry, did someone else want to say something? Did I interrupt? No. Go ahead. Okay. Um, if uh, I think you you did send along a note about this, um, so uh, and I don't know if you included Jen in that uh, communication, but if if you could do that and we could maybe modify the language somewhat so it conforms with the work that you're doing and so that we we understand the the work that you're doing and the report that's coming back and whether or not. The, you're successful with a grant. Um, that would be that would be very helpful. Two uh, two other comments, um, Madam Chair, if you don't mind. That it, absolutely. It, you know, it this doesn't speak directly to the state employee plans or Medicaid. Of course, this is only going to our benchmark for the exchange plans. Um, but it may make sense if the committee decides to also push that out to 2024 so that it is informed by the analysis that we're performing on our benchmark. Um, and the other thing is I do believe that Vermont Medicaid does currently cover hearing aids. So you may want to hear from Diva on that aspect because right. that may not be necessary. I think just to clarify, I think they do cover it, but it, not to the extent necessarily to the extent contemplated by the bill. Go ahead, Ruth. Senator Hardy. You know, no worries. <laughs> um, okay. uh, could, uh, Jill, thank you, Madam Chair. Jill, could I, this grant that you're getting sounds great. Um, and wondering if there are some specific topics that you are planning on asking and looking into um, about in this analysis. It sounds like hearing aids is on your list. 
Are there other areas that are on your list? Do you mean other other um, new benefit mandates that we could look at? Yeah, uh, yeah, other things. I mean, I'll just throw another one out there that I'm interested in hearing, learning more about. There's no bill on it, but I am working on something for next session about fertility coverage. And I know that's a super expensive. So I would love to get more information on that. Um, and I'm sure we all could come up with other things. So I'm wondering if you have a list and, and given the timing, it seems to me that we might want to hold back on implementing new mandates, even without effective dates out into the future and wait to hear what your analysis is and then sort of decide what is reasonable and possible. Um, that's my thinking, but I would like to know what's on your list to look at. So thank you for that question. That is that is what we would propose as well. I think that's a great idea. We would invite the legislature to, you know, if there are things that you're interested in us looking at, we'd be happy to look at them and add them to it. I don't think we have a specific list at this point, um, but again, I can add, uh, I think my colleague Ellie, Emily um, is leading the grant process so she can maybe speak to that a little better. Okay. Thank you. Um, so to, to your question, Senator Hardy, um, part of this whole benchmark updating process, while I think, you know, a lot of the cost and the analysis will go towards the CMS application and the actuarial analysis there, before that even happens, the state has outlined kind of uh, the state's internal process of how we're going to go about updating the benchmark plan. And that, um, I believe it's on DIVA's website, and if you're interested, I can put that along, but that process, um, we're envisioning it as being a stakeholder engagement. So, you know, having the uh, issuers involved in that, the healthcare advocate, any other interested parties, where I think that will be uh, an opportunity to kind of talk about policy objectives as well, and what benefits are people, or what needs are people seeing in the market that aren't being addressed and then have that be more of a collaborative effort to say, okay, these are the areas we think we should focus on um, and then move, kind of have it be definitely a, you know, a collaborative and kind of um, participatory process instead of it just being like, okay, we're just gonna focus on these benefits. We wanna, we wanna be able to make sure we're understanding um, and studying the market rather than assuming that we know, you know, where the needs are and, and what needs to be added. So. Um, other states, uh, for example, other states have done this. Um, I know Illinois is one state that has updated their benchmark plan and they wanted to focus on um, mental health and substance use disorder um, to try to tackle the opioid issues. Um, so they were focused on that and up their benchmark plan accordingly. So I think it just depends on, you know, what comes out of our, our stakeholder engagement um, what we find maybe that other states are doing that we, we could see could benefit Vermont. So I don't think I, I'm trying not to go into this process assuming that I know, you know, what things should be added or shouldn't be added. I think it really just needs to be like a collaborative process and, um, you know, with, with many stakeholders to try to, to try to work through this. But I also would say it would be very welcome, um, if the legislature had issues or, or policy objectives that we should consider. I think that would be great and, and maybe provide that a more of a direction uh, for this process and some pointed areas that, that um, you all would like us to look at. That yeah, would be great. Thank you, Emily. That, that would be great. I think that rather than trying to push forward something, even with extended dates, just providing some a list or guidance about what we're interested in hearing about. And certainly, you know, hearing aids is one of them for sure. And I'm sure others, we could come up with a nice list and that wouldn't mandate anything, but would help you with your thinking and would be easier for us to tackle at this point in the session, I think, as so well. I'm uh, thank you, Senator Hardy. That's uh, well said. Um, and I think, uh, but hearing aids for me are at, at, at that the top of many lists. But so, and why don't we do this? Uh, send your comments, please, you, Jill and Emily. You've heard the conversation. You can help us uh, modify this language wherever it goes. We don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> uh, but 
So if you could can do that. And then in the meantime, we'll also be thinking about those um, changes that might help uh, from our perspective on the benchmark plan. You've already heard two. I don't know how dentures fits in this, uh, and, but we've heard that one. And I know we hear it over and again, particularly with the increased a age of our population. Um, and then, and you brought up mental health and substance use disorder uh, treatment. And that's been an ongoing concern uh, from the, both with private insurers and our Medicaid folks about the extent to which uh, folks can be treated. How many counseling sessions, for example, has always been difficult to determine. And uh, so I would, I would welcome that one on the list as well, so, or those two, Senator Hooker. And I've also heard from home health agencies that they would like to see more follow-up for people who are um, dismissed from hospitals so that you know they don't have to return to the hospital because they haven't had enough care and follow-up. And I don't know how that would fit in, but certainly something that I think needs attention. Yeah, I know that, that I, that fits in a lot of different places, including the coordinated community service issue that we've been looking at. So, okay, this is very helpful. Uh, Jill, thank you for reaching out in the first place. Really appreciate it. And I think something good might come of this. I think the good you're doing is certainly gonna come of it. Uh, so, and as you know, legislators are not apt to be available all the time to give input in a stakeholder process, but we certainly can add our thoughts at this point and help things along. Senator Hardy. Thanks, Madam Chair. I was just thinking of strategy about vehicles <laughs> um, for this type of thing and also potentially for this the next bill that we're going to go over and one bill that we have from the house that might work i don't know jen i would obviously <coughs> defer to you is the the h430 i think it is the dr dinosaur bill because that's about expanding coverage under medicaid and it we might be able to make that argument that this is about looking at other areas that we could potentially expand coverage um, and S120 is also that. So there might be some provisions in this bill and the next bill that could fit in that if we can make the- that, That's going to be our, that's going to be our ongoing discussion yeah. and challenge. It's good. That was just a thought I had last night and it looking oh, at the bill, it seems uh, like listen. something might, possible, might be possible. If you want to so, look at that, Jen, and see what you think. <laughs> I think you probably want to talk to Secretary Bloomer because it's going to be up to him whether something is germane or not. So we're so we'll we'll have a broader conversation about that um, after we've completed some of the work on our on the bills. Okay, um, Jill and Emily, is there anything else that we need to hear um, and we need to know at this point? I don't believe so. The other, excuse me. I was going to sneeze there. The other sections on dur durable medical equipment and the studies about two primary care visits, we we are fine with those as well. Just to put it on. Okay, record. that's good to hear. All right. Yeah. No. I and uh, how those uh, studies end up and where they end up, I think, will be important. The primary care visits have always been kind of the barrier. If you have to lay out a copay, uh, you may not go when you when you should for prevention, and that's one of our goals. But thank you for that testimony. Thank you for the opportunity. All right. Okay. So committee, any other discussion on 132? I think there are some sections that I'm willing to um, forego. We'll certainly hear from other people as we go forward on the bills next week. But um, I think as we identify things that are, that resonate with others and, can happen without a lot of debate. We'll keep moving those forward. Okay, so Jennifer Carby is here on S120. Thank you. Sure, I will put that one up now, just moving it over. 
Senator Hooker, you're the lead sponsor. Do you want to add anything? Just Where'd that this, <laughs> I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Um, just said, I think that this is important that we start, you know, that we look at um, ways to certainly um, increase access and affordability. This is one way to do it. We're hoping that this bill will help us to position ourselves as a state when things start happening at the federal level. And, you know, it's a step forward, I think. So. And maybe Senator Hardy would like to weigh in on it as the other lead sponsor. Sure. I, I, the, I think that there uh, is a potential opportunity for, as Senator Hooker said, to expand access and affordability um, with a new administration in D.C. And we just wanted to make sure that we had the ability to lay the groundwork for, for that on the off session and also to build capacity among legislators for um, understanding and leading on this issue next session if there is an opportunity for such a thing. Um, specifically expanding down the age eligibility for Medicaid and or Medicare and maybe expanding up the eligibility, the age eligibility for Dr. Dinosaur and finding um, creative ways to work with the federal government on this and also looking at our own system. So it's similar to what we were frankly just talking about, but um, ways to expand coverage with, with also uh, maintaining affordability, which is a really tough thing to do. So um, this is just, off session work to try to get at that um, and um, in a focused way. So, okay. So, and I'm going to suggest that as we go through the bill and then when we go back through 132, there may be some things that we want to combine because we've been, you know, we'll talk about all this stuff and we, we throw it all in the hopper and out will come something. <laughs> That's a, I'll end it there. Out will come something. Okay. A sausage will get made. <laughs> you got it. Okay. Jen Carby, thank you. All right. There we go. This is S120. Uh, and as you know, it, it was introduced by three members of this committee Senators Hooker, Hardy, and Cummings. It is an act relating to the Joint Legislative Healthcare Affordability Study Committee. It starts out with findings. So it has the gener General Assembly finds that the COVID-19 pandemic has caused significant job losses with women especially impacted, likely causing a significant negative impact on the number of Vermonters without health insurance and placing greater financial strains on those who are underinsured. Second, many Vermonters who have health insurance are still exposed to high out-of-pocket costs through their plans, co-payment, co-insurance, and deductible requirements, in addition to ever-increasing premium rates. Currently, a family of four earning more than $105,000 per year who are enrolled in a silver plan through the Vermont Health Benefit Exchange may pay as much as $44,000 per year for health care between their health insurance premiums and out-of-pocket costs. In some instances, an individual or family may have health insurance but not be able to afford to receive necessary health care services because of the out-of-pocket costs associated with their plan. Others who lack coverage or who are underinsured and receive necessary health care services find themselves saddled with substantial medical debt. Third, employers across the state, including local municipalities and school districts, small businesses and community organizations, face significant and persistent budget pressures due to the increasing cost of health care coverage for their employees. Fourth, hundreds of Vermonters lack access to any health insurance coverage due to their citizenship or immigration status, and many younger adults cannot afford to purchase adequate health insurance coverage. Fifth, Vermont is facing a significant shortage of health care providers, especially primary care physicians and nursing professionals in many areas of the state. And finally, the Biden administration has indicated interest in using its demonstration and waiver authorities to partner with states to pursue certain reforms that cannot be accomplished through Congress. 
The administration has signaled that it may be open to working with interested states to test strategies such as an expanded public option for health coverage. So those are the findings. And then it creates this committee in section two. So there is created the Joint Legislative Healthcare Affordability Study Committee to explore opportunities to make healthcare more affordable for Vermont residents and employers. The committee would be composed of the following six members, three current members of the House of Representatives, not all from the same party, who shall be appointed by the Speaker of the House, and three current members of the Senate, not all from the same party, who would be appointed by the Committee on Committees. The committee is directed to explore opportunities to make healthcare more affordable for Vermont residents and employers, including identifying potential opportunities to leverage federal flexibility and financing and to expand existing healthcare programs. The committee shall consider the following. The long-term trends in out-of-pocket costs in Vermont in individual and small group health insurance plans and in large group health insurance plans. The efficacy of Vermont's all-payer accountable care organization model and the changes to the model that would be necessary to make healthcare more affordable for Vermonters or whether an alternative model may be more effective. The extent to which Vermont's uninsured rate may have increased during the COVID-19 pandemic and the specific causes of any such increase. Opportunities to decrease healthcare disparities, especially those highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic and those attributable to a lack of access to affordable healthcare services and opportunities made available by the Biden administration to expand access to affordable health care through existing public health care programs or through the, expand, the creation of new or expanded public option programs, including the potential for expanding Medicare to cover individuals between 50 and 64 years of age, and for expanding Vermont's Dr. Dinosaur program to cover individuals up to 26 years of age to align with the young adult coverage under the Affordable Care Act. In order to gain a fuller understanding of the impact of healthcare affordability issues on Vermont residents, the committee would be required to solicit input from a wide range of stakeholders, including healthcare providers, healthcare administrators, Vermonters who lack health insurance or who have inadequate health coverage, employers, labor unions, members of the new American and black indigenous and people of color communities, Vermonters with low income and older Vermonters. Uh, beginning on or before September 15th, 2021, hold not less than eight public hearings, each in a different Vermont county, to gather information from stakeholders and other members of the public. Public hearings may be held in person or by remote means, and each public hearing would begin with a panel discussion involving committee members and local stakeholders selected by the committee and include an opportunity for public testimony and a summary of the findings from the field hearings would be included as an appendix to the committee's report. The committee through the Joint Fiscal Office would hire a consultant to coordinate the committee's work. In addition, the committee would have the administrative, technical and legal assistance of the Office of Legislative Operations, the Office of Legislative Council, and the Joint Fiscal Office. On or before January 15th, 2022, the committee would, would present to the General Assembly, its findings and recommendations regarding the most cost-effective ways to expand access to affordable health care for Vermonters without health insurance and those facing high health care costs and the various options available to implement these recommendations. The first meeting of the committee must occur by July 1st of this year. The committee would select House and Senate co-chairs from among, among its members at its first meeting and the co-chairs would alternate acting as chair at committee meetings. A majority of the committee's membership would constitute a quorum and the committee would cease to exist on January 15th, 2022, which is when its report is due. Then there's the compensation and reimbursement. So for attendance at meetings during adjournment of the General Assembly, the members of the committee, because they're all legislators, would be entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses under 2VSA section 23 for not more than 12 meetings. These payments would come from monies appropriated to the General Assembly and the bill would appropriate $175,000 to the Joint Fiscal Office from the General Fund in FY22 for a consultant to coordinate the activities of the committee and to cover related costs of actuarial analyses, research meetings, 
and the per diem compensation and reimbursement of expenses for members of the committee. And the act would take effect on passage. Okay. Why don't we take it down? Questions? So uh, it sounds like the actuarial analysis will be done on the expansion of um, things like Dr. Dinosaur. And then, but the, but the bulk of the work is to go out and listen to the public and gather data from the public. Am I, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I, go ahead, Cheryl. Did you want to say yes? I think so. Yeah. Uh, certainly, you know, Dr. Dinosaur and Medicare expansion are two of the possibilities. I think, you know, if we find that there are other ways to um, affect this access and, and affordability, then, you know, those two will be considered. But that's what, you know, the intent is so far. Would you? Okay. Agree? Okay. And the, so, if, so the, as I'm, I'm looking at it, there, your interest is in having uh, the legislators go out in the field, listening and setting up meetings across the state. Mm -hmm. And then uh, while at the same time, there will be a consultant analyzing information that is directed in the bill. So I'm I'm trying to I'm I'm trying to put those two things together. If there is there any is there was there any thought about taking the data or information that you get from the um, what might be gotten from the testimony and trying to analyze that? I, so it seems like there are two separate things here. One is a group going out and listening and gathering information and collating that information. But the other is a consultant analyzing two very specific things. One, Medicare, the other, Dr. Dinosaur. Yeah, I think you're right that there, there should be a connection between the two of those and um, oh, that I, there's- I don't know, it, maybe not, you know, well, they, you well, know it could be I value think, in you know, both. Right, you know, there's uh, wanting to hear from the public, particularly in this post-pandemic, hopefully post-pandemic, <laughs> end of pandemic, um, about um, access and affordability of healthcare coverage and um, what what people are experiencing on the ground, and um, and also um, sort of thinking about that in the context of the goal of our state, which is universal coverage for and universal healthcare for everyone. And you know, is that happening? And if not, how can we make it happen? And those two ideas are in the bill, but there may be other ideas that we hear and also ideas that come to us from the feds. And this is really in connection with the other work that's going on in terms of our global commitment and the all the payment talk discussion we've been having too, because I think that that, you know, is obviously those are part of the puzzle. Okay, so and and I just before we go to Josh, uh, Senator Terenzini, uh, then one of the findings is about the uninsured in our state, and we do have data on that, so it'd probably be important to understand what that means. All right, Senator Terenzini. Thank you, Senator Lines. I, um, my question probably piggybacks what you just said. I was wondering, do we know? Um, from the pandemic, how many people are uninsured as a direct effect of the of the pandemic? Nolan saying no. I, I see Nolan saying no. <laughs> we don't know that directly. We've Wait, been uh, let we, let Nolan answer. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead, Nolan. I think Senator Hardy can answer too. I think we just we don't know. You know, that's right. We do we do an annual we do a survey every two or three years, and that's the data we have. My understanding is that. The, the health department will be doing the survey again. It's called the Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey. And it's my understanding they'll be doing it again this fall. So we'll right, it's required every three years by statute. Uh, yeah. And, and Senator Alliance, I think anecdotally yeah. we've heard that people have, you know, who have lost their jobs have lost 
their health insurance. And so uh, anecdotally, at least, it seems as if uninsured or underinsured or, um, you know, the numbers have been rising. Senator Cummings. Uh, Nolan, have we seen an uptick in Medicaid? Because that's usually the process. If you lose your job and lose your health insurance, your next step is Medicaid. Yeah, so the, I, the problem with that is because of the CARES Act uh, FMAP increase. Okay. They have, don't. Uh, MOU, or uh, we have a moratorium on redeterminations. And so in Surat, there's no churn. People can come on, but they don't come off right now. So it's hard to determine if there's new people that wouldn't have stayed on, like, you know, the overall. So the numbers are clouded and it's hard to know. I think the answer is probably yes, but we don't, we can't tell from the data because it's too much noise in it. Okay. Okay. Other questions? So I, my, one of my questions was going to be why not look, have the uh, health reform oversight committee. And, uh, and by the way, I'm very interested in changing the name of that committee, but uh, why not have that group uh, be involved in this process um, with uh, the group of folks who have a foot in the door of finance and appropriations as well as healthcare. Uh, but it sounds like you're more interested in having uh, folks going across the state and gathering information from uh, interested parties rather than having the group make uh, specific decisions and recommendations except for as completed by the consultant. I'm trying to sort out the thinking behind the that. Yeah, um, uh, Senator, sorry, uh, Cheryl, I don't want to keep stepping on you if you're gonna, <laughs> um, I would say that um, that's a great idea to have that health reform oversight or whatever it's called or whatever new name you would like it to have <laughs> um, involved or consultant. That actually hadn't occurred to me. So I think that that's a good idea. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that in, in talking about this bill that Cheryl and I or Senator Hooker and I have talked about is when we all go out and campaign, what we hear from our constituents as the number one problem, the number one concern they have is healthcare. And you know, I heard that time and time again, both times that I was out campaigning, especially the first time when I was knocking on thousands of doors. And it doesn't feel like what we talk about here is necessarily connected to what we're hearing out in the field all the time. And so a lot of this is what, what, do, what are people in our community saying about the type of access they have? How expensive is it? And what is it sort of like, real Vermonters on the ground, what are they experiencing? Um, and how can we learn from that as legislators when we're not campaigning, that it's you know part of our job, not a part of our politics, if you know what I mean. And, um, and then taking that and using it to create policy with the help of a consultant who has some expertise while also building um, the capacity to do this work next session sort of hit the ground running. And it's super connected to some of the things in your bill and other bills that we're talking about. And I think, you know, combining efforts is a great idea. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Okay. All right, so we will pick up some testimony on the bill and we'll, we'll try to sort out the best way to go forward, what to add, what to subtract, what to perhaps modify, and then what to do with it, which is the last question. Maybe it should be the first. We gotta figure out how to, how to move it along and we will do that. And part of it may end up um, being incorporated into the budget, we don't know. That frequently happens to some of our bills at the end of the session. All right.